Hi everybody, Zandile here, aka Miss Masumbuga on Twitter, and welcome to my YouTube space. The aim of this space is to center the South African narrative from an ideologically African perspective, looking at how we got where we are, where we actually are, and answering the question, what happens after the revolution? This is part two of the essay titled the pacification of black South African emancipation. This time, we discuss the media and propaganda campaigns that led to the dulling of the black apartheid experience. Feel free to engage and subscribe to get the next part. Enjoy the video. We have 35% unemployment rate. We are the most unequal society in the world. We are living with a country where 54% of its population is living in poverty. South Africa is a cappuccino society, which is a vast, huge black majority at the bottom, with cream on top and a few chocolate sprinklings are, you know, on the top of it. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history. Then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The world around it will forget even faster. Milan Kundera. The pacification of black South Africans using the buzzword of reconciliation, as discussed in the previous essay, was a textbook case in the liquidation of a people. Reconciliation, as good examples, could have been appropriate between the ANC and IFP that led to the ending of the political killings in the 90s in Guazulu Natal, or the Tosa and the Vengu who were shamelessly turned against one another, and that between the Usutu and Mandlagazi Zulu royal factions, who were dealt the same cards by the British, but subsequently dealt with their issues independently of them. These examples can be deeper delved into for sure, but are pertinent because they represent a reconciliation of groups that had once been friendly towards each other and, through natural disagreements or sabotage, as is wont to happen between neighbours, fell out, but were able to reach consensus and sort out their differences. These examples are also pertinent because they highlight the fact that African unity is not only very possible and powerful, but is also of paramount importance. It is, however, understandable why one would have faith in the TRC. It was sold as a resounding success at the time, not only in South Africa, but worldwide through the Rainbow Nation narrative, even as the center for the study of violence and reconciliation and the Kulumani support group in 1998 released a report that stated that the commission had failed to achieve reconciliation between black and white people in South Africa. In subsequent years, it has been suggested through the years that the TRC was nothing but a dummy that we suckled on, that produced absolutely no milk. The revered anti-African Mahatma Gandhi once wrote that the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Many have interpreted this to mean that the act of forgiveness makes the forgiver strong and failure to forgive makes the person refusing to forgive weak. The quote is dated 1931, so it may well be that Gandhi 
a renowned pacifist in his old age by then, was serious about strength lying solely in forgiveness. A decade earlier, however, in the Doctrine of the Sword, Gandhi wrote, I believe that non-violence is infinitely superior to violence. Forgiveness is more manly than punishment. Forgiveness adorns a soldier, but abstinence is forgiveness only when there is the power to punish it. It is meaningless when it pretends to proceed from a helpless creature." End quote. Although in the 1921 account, Gandhi seeks to cement his views on Satyagraha and the concept of nonviolent resistance, it is clear from a complete reading that his intent is not to preach passivity lack of preparation or weakness. In the Doctrine of the Sword, he stresses that the people must be ready and prepared to respond to violence if needs be. It is in this light that he writes, I do believe that where there is only a choice between cowardice and violence, I would advise violence. Therefore, Gandhi's position doesn't seem to have been rooted in blanket forgiveness. It seems to have been rooted in the knowledge that one is choosing nonviolence from a position of strength, not because one fears that they are unable to win, but simply because what they need is justice in the strongest terms. It is important to include Gandhi in the South African context because Nelson Mandela, the president leading South Africa during, and I would say too, this pacification, considered Gandhi one of his greatest teachers and wrote about him in the year 2000. He is the archetypal anti-colonial revolutionary. Both Gandhi and I suffered colonial oppression, and both of us mobilized our respective peoples against governments that violated our freedoms. This is how the majority of people still live in South Africa, in townships created by apartheid. Come to any township, whether it be here in Cape Town or Johannesburg or Durban, and you get a sense of why it is people don't feel that really much has changed since democracy. The most important question for us to now interrogate as a people is the effect of this madness on the psyche of the average, poor, unlettered South African. To relieve their guilt, beneficiaries of apartheid have turned to our state of mind and seek to find and foster black pathology as the reason for our lack of progress. We see this in comments like Dan Ruet dismissing Fudvuts being the father of apartheid in order to name Banyaza Lesufi as the real racist, even claiming that Lesufi was not a real South African. The clear betrayal of the ruling elites, compounded with the ever-firming grip of Western capitalism and the advent of Chinese economic encroachment, has left our peoples concussed and confused while also trauma bonded to their oppression. This has manifested itself in the self-destructive behavior born out of a sense of hopelessness, such as the burning of public spaces as the only means of protest against a government that often ignores them. The rampant crime of our townships and the city streets by the young and disenfranchised, including the excessive alcoholism and drug addiction, gang violence, 
our consumption of self-loathing, poverty-shaming media brought to us by, amongst others, Nasbers and the company MultiChoice in the form of Moja Love and Mzansi Magic. Add to that the fear of white farmers in the rural areas who often confiscate livestock on flimsy pretenses as well as our violence towards the most vulnerable in our society. And you find a people existing in a state of continuous, prolonged torture of their very minds. This psychological hold on the black mind has even strained our relationships with our African brothers. It is no stretch to admit that our brethren have contributed to some of the ills of this society, particularly in poor communities. And that is not to be dismissed because it has real world consequences. However, just as in the case of our own perceived pathology, the issue is more complex and nuanced than it is on the surface. With many lamenting the sale of drugs by West African drug lords, the increasing number of East African spaza shops that saturate within our township communities, where local business can no longer compete, and the cheap wages accepted by our non-South African counterparts in the unskilled labor market that our people simply cannot accept and again cannot compete with. One must notice with sadness in the heart that when violence spills over as a result of genuine frustration, it is only ever visited upon people who look like us and with whom we actually have so much more in common including the reason for our combined suffering being those who do not look like us. Meanwhile, our government continues with its blatant betrayal of the masses, with agreements with the East and West, whose benefits are never felt in any concrete forms on the ground. In the end, what we do is scapegoat the poor, with our sustained anti-blackness as we feel overwhelmed by the white capital power structures that dictate to and are in collusion with our toothless, compromised, greedy governments. We then return to our vomit like the proverbial dog of Solomon, regurgitating and consuming the rainbow nation rhetoric a byproduct of the Democracy, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Rugby World Cup wins, and washing powder advers advertisements we've been fed. Let me give you a weather forecast, Joe. Blue skies, beautiful day, amazing sea, and not one in sight. Heaven on earth. You cannot beat this. While the likes of Vicky Momberg Adam Katsavelos and Judge Mabel Janssen continue to pathologize our existence and dismiss our historical pain, which we in turn have been told was healed post-1994, when we were eventually included in our own political discourse. Yet we never once heard an apology. Until we confront and fully hold accountable the systems and the people in control of those systems that continue to oppress and humiliate us, and until we deal with the land issue by centering the needs of the dispossessed African majority instead of investors, until we are serious about ensuring redress, healing the historic wounds and listening to the real, lived experiences of the people most affected by our history. And until we make it clear that these wants and needs are non-negotiable, 
we will continue to be a pacified people, pacified into a sense of living while not alive, as tolerated tenants in the land of our own ancestors. Feroz Manji writes that the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. There remains today the challenge of building strong left working class movements in Africa. Whatever the constraints that we may have inherited from our history, the reality is that after independence, our national bourgeoisies have failed to deliver on their promises." End quote. Our beloved Bandu, Steve Beagle, wrote that the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the minds of those whom they oppress. While Che Guevara said, I am not a liberator, the people free themselves. And you can add to that Fidel Castro's statement where he says, I began revolution with 82 men. If I had to do it again, I would do it with 10 or 15 in absolute faith. It does not matter how small you are, if you have faith and a plan of action. These revolutionaries all teach us, as South Africans, one thing. If we have our minds right, and just a few committed revolutionaries, we have all we need. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like or dislike, and to subscribe and share if you're that way inclined.